My guest this week is Nathan Lancaster, an absolutely on fire campus missionary, talking about the the experience of Catholics, of Christians, of of people who are seeking on college campuses today in North America, uh, beginning with his own journey as a guy who was kind of going to mass, going through the motions, encountered Jesus in a powerful way in the Eucharist at a Catholic conference, and then carried that energy with him into his work as a campus missionary. It's exciting stuff. It's it's hopeful. It's scary in some cases, but ultimately it's this just a conversation just rooted and steeped in, in the Bible, in scripture, in a love for the mission of Christ, the gospel, and the Catholic faith. You'll learn a ton. You'll dig deep. We do. I think you'll love it. Please watch and enjoy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you for joining us. If you're listening on podcasts, please make sure you subscribe and follow the show wherever you find it. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, uh, your reviews help to push the podcast out to more listeners, expand the reach of these conversations. So please do subscribe and leave some ratings and reviews if you can. If you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. Please join our growing community of people subscribing to this channel, following this work, and please do interact in the comments below, guys. And thank you for joining us uh, on YouTube. I am joined this week by Nathan Lancaster. He is a Catholic campus missionary at the University of Kentucky. He had a deep conversion during his time in college and has answered the call to serve the new generation of Christians for the last three years. He's on the front lines of the modern secular campus, and he says he's been amazed to see how many young people are hungry for the truth. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you for being here, Nathan. Welcome to the show. Uh, and hello. Hey, Keith. It's really good to be on here. And uh, like we were just talking about, I've listened to your podcast for quite some time. I was introduced to it a couple months ago, and I've kind of been binging it. Um, and I just wanted to wanted to reach out and give a little bit of a new perspective to uh, to your show listeners, a uh, perspective that is more of, yeah, someone who's on the front lines, someone who's yeah. actively um, evangelizing which I know a lot of your uh, your hosts or in your co-hosts are people that are evangelizing and people that are apologists or they might be instructors at certain universities. Um, but I serve, yeah, as someone who goes out on a college campus and is a missionary with everything that that term comes with and its baggage. Like that's what I get to do. Um, so, yeah. That's that's fantastic. Well, thank you for thank you for being a loyal listener, and thank you for for reaching out. You know, I I get a lot of random emails sometimes. Not that yours is random, but I get a lot of random emails. And when I got yours, you there was a passion in your in, in tenor in your email that I was like, yes, this is exactly the guy I want to have on the show. An awesome topic. I have a deep heart for campus uh, missionary work and campus ministry work. I spent a lot of time in the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. There's a great uh, John Paul II Center there that does, um, you know, kind of the Catholic work on some of the campuses that are there, a couple of universities that are there. Do some mm -hmm. awesome work. And I have some friends who were longtime campus ministers. Uh, and I, before I became Catholic, had a little stint with Campus Crusade for Christ, who was an evangelical. You may have heard of them. Evangelical. They've said, I think, since rebranded. I think the Crusade bit was a bit, a bit heavy handed, maybe, that they were using. And they did a little bit of a rebrand. But I was involved with that for a little bit as an evangelical Christian, super uncomfortable with the work. It wasn't really my wheelhouse. And, you know, that was also one of the things that led me to begin looking into the Catholic Church because we were doing this missionary work and asking these questions and leading leading people on campus down this, you know, this Roman road to conversion that we used to use that came from Romans and was this kind of framework for giving your life to Christ. And I that began to bug me at one point, Nathan, like, well, okay, well, but why is that the, like, okay, this is biblical, but we're picking out different verses and kind of rearranging them. And, and when do we actually see people coming to Christ in the Bible in, in this way? So, mm -hmm. you know, the, my encounter, my, my time as a brief time, I should say, as a campus uh, missionary, uh, kind of led to Catholicism <laughs> for me. I know you though have a really interesting kind of faith journey. Uh, you mentioned you're you're kind of cradle Catholic, but came to a real experience of Christ at kind of a you know a, a youth a, a college university age oriented kind of outreach thing. We'll we'll go into that. Um, 
it sounds like a fascinating story. So Emil, let, let's hear that, how you, you know, that, that journey for you, where it began, where it went, and then how that led into your passion for, you know, missionary work uh, on the college campus, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, just real quick, your story is very common among the uh, students that I get to to work with. And it was prevalent in my life. And that's why I'm here where I am today. That's awesome. Uh, so I, yeah, I am from Mississippi, actually. So not very many Catholics are in Mississippi, um, but I'm one of the few. It's right in the heart of the Bible Belt. And so the vast majority of people that live in the area are believing Christians, which which is something that um, is a benefit yeah, yeah. for sure, because uh, just religion is something that's actually talked about and it's brought up. Um, and especially on Sunday mornings, it's really hard to get to your favorite lunch spot because everybody's getting out of church. And my dad actually used to say, you know, let's go to the earlier mass so we can, so we can beat all the, the Protestants. Uh, but which is funny because he, he used to be, he, he was actually a, a Protestant. He became Catholic shortly after I was born. Um, so I, yeah, grew up, um, I would say a practicing Catholic. Uh, so my family, it was, it was me for a while. And then uh, my little sister was born about nine years after I, I was born. So I was only child for a while um, and would always go to Catholic school. My, my parents worked very hard to make sure that they, they sent me to Catholic school. And all my friends um, in that area, you know, going to school, I was going to school with a bunch of Catholics, which was really cool. And I didn't really know about the demographics of how it's like 5% Catholic and, <laughs> you know, like 75% Protestant in, in the area. Um, but for growing up, it was a lot of going through the motions. And I just remember um, doing doing the things that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to mass on Sundays and you go to confession when your school makes you go to confession during yeah, Lent yeah, and during yeah, yeah. Uh, Advent. And you outside of that, you don't really pray unless you go to, unless you pray at the beginning of the, the class day, or you might say grace before meals. Um, but just kind of a very common, common story. And in, in my friend group, and just in general, I would say. Um, and so growing up, I, I really liked to be involved in different things. I really liked to find my worth in um, who I knew and what I did. And so I, I feel like that was a little bit where the, the true Christian message was beginning to get lost of, you know, everyone is, um, is made in the image and likeness of God and that you don't have to, to do anything to earn love. You, you actually are just, are you just loved? And so I, I kind of tended towards this side of the things I do are what make me loved. And so that was very common in, in high school. Um, you know, I would uh, try to do a bunch of different clubs and activities and sports. Um, I wanted to get straight A's. I wanted to be the best student. I wanted to be the coolest. I uh, wanted to run for student government. wanted to do all of that. And it obviously caused me to want to do a lot of the other things that everybody's doing, Um which just comes with things you get into in high school. And so yeah, falling yeah. into a lot of the old habits that people in high school these days fall into, which that age keeps shifting. Now it's getting younger and younger, yeah. unfortunately. Um, but so, yeah, I became a pretty big partier in high school and my college decision was primarily based off of um, it was based off of scholarships, but it was also based off of where can I go have the most fun <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which which God ended up using that because yeah, yeah, when I right. made the decision to go to college, I went to uh, the state school where I'm from, so the University of Mississippi. And little did I know I would have an incredible conversion to to Jesus there. And I say conversion, but it's really a, a, a reversion, right? Being being baptized as an infant, uh, receiving uh, that grace, receiving this adoption um, as a, as a beloved son of God was something I didn't really know it happened until my, my deeper reversion. Um, but that took place uh, my sophomore year. So let's backtrack to my freshman year. My freshman year, I joined a fraternity. And if you're not familiar with 
um, like universities in the deep South, it's very, very uh, fraternity and sorority oriented. So if you're not in one of those, you're probably not um, as maybe as important on campus. Obviously, <laughs> that's not true. But to go to one of these SEC schools, one of these universities is to enter into this social atmosphere where everyone kind of knows everybody, but you want to join one of these organizations because that's how you meet people. That's how you yeah, yeah. Um, gain friends. That's how you um, get to do all these fun things that you started doing in, in high school. And so I yeah, joined one of those and fell into just a ton of, of sin. And I became very numb to my, uh, my own conscience. I became very cynical. I, yeah, yeah. uh, just, I became very prideful. I wasn't, I wasn't living as I was supposed to as a baptized Catholic. And, but it's just like all that I, all that I knew it's, it's the, the air that I breathed, the, the water yeah. that I swam yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but kind of going from, from there is, and, and, I, and I really see this when I, when we try to, you know, unravel the Christian message and present the gospel to students. We, we always say like, you have to know that something's wrong before you know it can be fixed. Uh, and obviously that's where the idea of original sin, the idea of concupiscence, the idea of sin in general um, came in. So yeah, just my, my sinful habits got to a point where I didn't really know what I was doing with my life. I was going to class and I, I was like dating around, but I wasn't doing it virtuously. I didn't have virtuous friends. Uh, I, I didn't have anyone as a good role model. And, uh, but I, I did know one thing and that I needed to go to mass on Sundays. So I would go to mass on Sundays and I would do one hour of worship a week. And then I'd leave it at the door <clears throat> and go, go to class. Um, and go to fraternity parties and pick it back up next week and just kind of the, the other 167 hours of the week didn't really think twice yeah, about yeah. God. Um, and that's ultimately the the most common story of so many people who are raised with a Christian background. Yeah. I believe 70 to 80 percent of students who have a faith a uh, Christian background who go to college will will end up not having it by the time that they're 23. Wow. Um, and so college is that that area is a very key part of the world because it's where you're being introduced to all these ideas. It's where you're being introduced to all these different um, people's backgrounds. And you obviously start to question how you were raised. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't have the answers to those questions, you're gonna go with the with the flow, and we know where the flow is right now on a in the secular world, and so all all that to say, God was working, and <clears throat> after mass, one one uh, one day I met this focus missionary. And I didn't know what a focus missionary was, but he came up to me, <clears throat> and he basically asked to to get coffee, um, and I kind of like. He, he he texted me a couple days later and I kind of shrugged him off. And then eventually I saw him again after mass and we, we start up a, a, a slight friendship. Um, and I go to one of his Bible studies and I don't go to another Bible study the rest of my freshman year, <laughs> but these little seeds that are being planted are, yeah, are, yeah. are starting to take, to take effect. Um, so the summer going into my sophomore year was really important because um, I started to date a girl who actually took her Catholic faith seriously and it inspired me. And so I got a little bit more involved in the Catholic campus ministry at the University of Mississippi, <clears throat> but I didn't want to get too involved because to me, they were kind of the weird kids because <laughs> why would you come to college to, yeah. you know, to go pray like that's weird as much as i would claim that i'm a christian it's still it was still kind of weird to me um but then i, I met another focus missionary and my interactions with him are, are 
were amazing because he had a very similar story as me. He was in a fraternity at a big school. He was very social. He uh, was just super easy to talk to. And I was like, well, he's normal. This is weird. Like I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to be around normal people doing this. And so uh, one thing leads to another and I start coming around a little bit. I'll go to a event every maybe like couple weeks and I get invited to go to this conference and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's, it's, it's a week, it's the week after new year's and at where I went to school, we had really long Christmas breaks for some reason. They're like five week long Christmas breaks. And so I knew that I would be pretty, pretty bored at that point. So I decided to go and one of my really good friends was going to, which was exciting. Um, and the girl that I was dating at the time was going. So <laughs> I was, I was excited, but yeah, those couple of weeks leading up to that were really, really bad because I had, I was getting into those terrible habits again. Yeah. 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 And I was back home with some of my friends and I would just do nothing but be lazy. Um, and just like, drink and party and just do all the things that I, I knew I shouldn't be doing, but I was doing it anyway, because it's all I knew. And then, which is perfect. Cause I went to seek at the perfect time. And so if for, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with seek, it's a, it's a Catholic conference for college students from anywhere around the world, but particularly in the United States. And it can be anywhere from 15 to 20,000 students. Um, I believe this past year there was about 20,000 was a wow. record breaking year, but this, this seek was in um, Indianapolis and it was seek 2019. And it was my, it was my sophomore year. And that week changed my life completely. Um, so a few reasons why it changed my life was number one, just the people that were there. Um, I had not so much as been in a room with more than 300 young Catholics before in my life to celebrate mass. This time I was in a room with 17,000 <laughs> and wow. not just that, but there were these, there were these booths. There's this giant hall of just hundreds of tables of booths with Catholic companies and organizations and graduate programs and, uh, religious sister organizations and and priest orders and everything you can imagine. It's like Catholic Disneyland, <laughs> and and there's just all these well known uh, Catholic American Catholics there. And I was just my eyes were opened, and like I said, all these people were were vibrant. They were um, joy filled. They were living in a way that I didn't know was possible. And, you know, and then we went, there was this concert, like the second night, <clears throat> I believe need to breathe was there. And we just had, and the energy in that crowd was insane. And need to breathe even said like, you know, you Catholics know how to have fun. This is the most, this is the <laughs> loudest we've ever played in. And, and I just remember thinking to myself, well, but where's the alcohol? Like, where's the drugs? Yeah, why, yeah, yeah. why aren't? why are these people actually having more fun and they're aware of their surroundings? <laughs> and that's just something that, that was completely foreign to me. Yeah. 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 And so, and another thing too, is like I said, I like to be really, um, I was really on top of my studies in the midst of all this. So I was very intellectual and I got to go to talks like the fourth cup from Dr. Scott Hahn yeah, and yeah, how to pray the mass like never before by father Mike Schmitz <laughs> and go into these talks for the first time, I'm like learning these Catholic truths. Yeah, yeah. That I felt like I had never heard in my life. Yeah, from the best like possible I, people to teach you, to, which is amazing. Exactly, and they're, they're. It's not just that they're smart, but they're incredibly charitable. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're incredibly humble and just great men and women to be around. Like Sister Miriam James talk. I don't think anyone didn't cry that night. Yes, yeah. I've heard her speak before. <laughs> and I've cried. I have cried. <laughs> So all these, and, and, and for me, someone, you know, some people, maybe they were raised 
in the Catholic church to, to know these people already. But for me, this was like a whole new world. Yeah. And to, to realize that our faith has such an intellectual ground to it, to realize that our, the, the reasons that we do the things that we do make so much sense. Like why we have certain elements to our liturgy, why we have these certain developments that have occurred over the past 2000 years, why the church has lasted the test of time. <clears throat> and they all start to hit me. And then the last night before uh, we go back home is the big night is adoration. And I had only been to adoration maybe like two or three times up until this point. And in like that night, cause it was, there is adoration, but there's also a procession that happens. There's also almost a thousand confessions that are that are heard every seek yeah, that yes, night yes, yeah. um, by hundreds of priests, and it was just unlike anything I'd ever been to. Because yes, there was like praise and worship music, and there was a big lighting and maybe something some things you would um, kind of compare with maybe some of your non-denominational mega church vibes, but, but the difference was like Jesus was present in the room and there is a focus to our worship. And as he proceeded by me, I just remember weeping yeah. and I had not been emotional ever about my faith. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I always say that, Jesus profoundly encountered me in the Eucharist wow. that night. Wow. And my life has never been the same since. Um, I guess I, I didn't even mention what I was studying. I, I was an engineering major, <laughs> which, I mean, doesn't really matter anymore because I just, I said yes to being a missionary. <laughs> yeah, who cares? <laughs> um, but I was, I was studying engineering, but I remember walking out of that room and something had changed. Something said to me, <clears throat> something in, in, in my heart of hearts, I really feel like it was a movement of the Holy Spirit. Just felt the desire to go and share this with others. You know, little did I know that that's actually the call of every baptized Catholic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But tr truly, I felt for the first time in my life that my faith was alive, that I was alive, and. And yeah, just I felt all the grace come in. Um, and so that is this kind of the peak right there. Um, and then, yeah, I'd love to share kind of going from there, um, unless you have any any thoughts. Yeah, let's let's sit in the peak for a second. I think that's a fantastic mm -hmm. story. I, I love so much about that. You know, I had my I I had experience of going to a conference for priests and and like lay leadership teams many years ago when I was just kind of a new Catholic and I was volunteering in my parish and went with the team, the, the priest, the religious sister, a couple of them and a couple of the people in this team and went to this giant conference and it ended up being I think like a thousand priests. It was it was all like you know, all the priests in the Archdiocese of Detroit, plus their like their pastoral teams it ended up being like just hundreds and hundreds of priests and I, as you're say, you know, telling us this story, I can think of just how deeply I encountered my faith as a new Catholic when we had like, you know, a night of adoration. I think Matt Marr was there playing a concert with an adoration, right? With Jesus in the, you know, the host in the monstrance. And like you said, there was, there were confessions and there was, I can, the, this, this hall just packed down the hallways every like, you know, 12 feet or so, a priest and a chair and a chair, a little screen. And just, you know, hundreds of, of confessions, right, being heard. And for somebody who hasn't experienced that, like, I can relate to what you're saying. Somebody who hasn't experienced that, like, the, 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 the Holy Spirit is palpable, like, in, in the room, right, in that environment, right, in, in, in that worship. Like, you said that, you know, Jesus processed by you in the, in the host, in the, on, in the monstrance. And we, we believe as Catholics that he's really present there in some kind of miraculous way we can't understand but like that that strikes you 
Mm -hmm. right in an amazing way the reality of that and then to, to experience an environment where so many people are coming before christ in confession and freeing themselves from the bondage of sin right and saying yes to christ mm -hmm. and not just one or two or three but you know hundreds or thousands of people are, are doing that like that just really supercharges kind of an environment and i think you know for me it sounds like for you too Nathan, just really, especially, you know, you know, for you kind of on the fringes of your faith in a sense, like that just is such a demonstration of the truth and the reality and the grace and the power in the Catholic faith. Right? It's, it's almost like, like just seeing it supercharged, right? Mm -hmm. Experiencing it at, you know, on, on steroids or something, right? Yeah, it's like the Catholic Super Bowl. Yes, yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Watching football, okay. Super Bowl, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, yeah, that, that's a great, great, great sports analogy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so amazing, especially for you as somebody who is kind of, like I said, on the, on the fringes, right? Or not really, you, you don't know what to make of it in a sense, and you're kind of going to kind of check it out. Like, that's a real powerful witness for mm -hmm. you right to see to see that and to see like you said so many people who were living their faith and who knew their faith and could understand it and were unpacking it for you in a way like yeah you know what this makes sense mm -hmm. right to to hear that you know lived experience and from those people it's got to be yeah hugely impactful right mm -hmm. yeah yeah because like it was it was seeing things through a new lens. Yeah, yeah. And m maybe some of it was the fact that I'm around so many people and we all believe the same thing. And there's a little bit of that looking over each other and saying, like, yeah, this this is true. But but there's also the just the, the weight of evidence and the weight of um, the, the fact that these people up here have given their lives to studying certain aspects of theology to doing biblical studies, to studying the church history and saying like, yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with this. I'm submitting to the, the authority of the church. And so many times that I, you know, have these conversations with non-Catholic Christians, I, I can go all day and talking with them, especially on campus. But at the end of the day, it comes down to a question of authority. And for, for me, especially in that moment of seek, placing myself under the authority of the body of Christ, his church was very freeing. Yeah. Not only did I receive the grace through the sacraments, but just knowing that to be able to live this out is to be a saint. And I, and I want, like I have a desire to be a saint now, whereas I previously, maybe I had a desire to be an engineer or maybe I had a desire to be successful and make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I had even had the desire to be a husband and a father. And those are all, um, and to varying degrees, great things, but I didn't have the desire to be a saint, but now yeah. I do. Yeah. And I believe that there's that quote, I don't know who it's by, but the only true tragedy in life is to fail to be a saint. Yeah. And yeah. that really hit me. I just, I just, I felt like that. And my testimony going from there has been, okay, so how do I get there? Yeah, that that's amazing. That's, <laughs> that's well said. So where did you go from there? Like what, what happened next? Cause you came, yeah. you know, obviously your trajectory, like you said, you know, engineering, that was cool, but you want, you're going to be a missionary now. <laughs> that's like, okay. So yeah, well, what happened when you got back? Well, that was my sophomore year. So I still had five semesters to finish my degree. <clears throat> and, um, but I, I changed a lot of my habits. Yeah. I stopped drinking. I stopped, um, doing drugs. I stopped even like swearing things that were just so I was so accustomed to from yeah, yeah. earlier in my life and people saw a difference in me. My, my friends were kind of confused. I would, I would go to these fraternity events and I wouldn't drink and, you know, obviously was underage. And so I just didn't, she chose not to. And that led to good conversations and wasn't still at the time, wasn't very foreign to my face. So I was kind of just going off of the top of my head with, with what I knew and how to defend that but I got some really good responses and um, but there, there was every now and then some of my friends was like, Oh, I miss you when you were, when you liked to party with us, or yeah. I miss you when you were more fun. <laughs> and I would just say like, you know, if, if that's what our friendship is, then, you know, 
maybe that says something about about our friendship and yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I don't want any friendships to just stay at that level um and so going from there was just a lot of fine tuning and growing and i started to go to daily mass for the first time what a what a gift it's been yes, to what... do that to actually receive daily bread yeah and i started to go to regular confession like i said like i didn't go to confession more than once every six months and i just thought that's what you did once in lent and once yeah. in advent um i didn't know i actually even in high school i was a eucharistic minister and but looking back on it i know for a fact that i was in a state of at least grave sin every single time because but i didn't know that you weren't supposed to receive the eucharist in the state of mortal sin i I didn't know that you know you had to go to confession for doing these things and it was just i definitely felt like like i said more people need to know this more people need to be need to be catechized i believe that one out of every five americans are fallen away catholics and so since there's so many people that fall into this group um i I want to do what i can to to help them um or at least just lend a listening ear if that's the most i can do is just listen to their story then um i I think that i've done a day's work and so Going from sophomore year, um, the girl I was dating at the time, we we did break up, and it was kind of a tough summer going into my junior year because I was away from that community. So I had a lot of that fellowship previously with the campus ministry, um, and they all went home for the summer, and I was still working a job at, in college. So it was really tough. But then my junior year, getting back in contact with the Focus Missionaries, the Focus Missionaries just helped me so much. I, I, I really looked up to them and they inspired me because not only were they, a lot of them were getting into their vocations, but a lot of them were just living lives centered around prayer and the Eucharist. And I just craved that so much. I And I started to read spiritual books. I started to read the scriptures. Um, I started to just do the things that you know, for centuries and centuries and centuries, that's just what Christians did. Yeah. But since we're in an era where that's not commonplace anymore, uh, it was like discovering a treasure. Yes. And so <laughs> I guess the next uh, great kind of part is my junior year is actually when COVID happened. So the spring break of my junior year is when the world shut down but that spring break i went on a pilgrimage to lords france and obviously that's where our lady appeared to saint bernadette and um, i got to i got to go on a pilgrimage uh, through focus and it was it was kind of crazy because it was the week that COVID was ramping up. So (laughs) we didn't know if we were going to make it back to America. Wow. Wow. Um, But I I met a girl on that trip from Chicago. um, And by the end of the trip, I started to catch feelings and (laughs) definitely um, she had, she had won me over and we got back and we were quarantined. So we would spend a lot of time talking on the phone um, and yeah, I just, for the, for really first, the first time just got to, um, date in a, in a great manner and oh, to man. have a, have a relationship centered around the Lord, yeah. um, and, and do it right. And so that, that ended up being who I married. So I'm, we're, we're married. We've been married for almost a year now and, uh, yeah, her name's Andrea. And so I just, these more, more graces that, that God is giving me. And yeah, yeah. I definitely, uh, that trip settled a lot of things for me. That, that pilgrimage that I went to Lords, I definitely knew that I wanted to be a missionary after going on that trip, that trip, so many things went wrong. We were missing our, uh, <clears throat> missing our trains. We were having to wait in long lines. We were really tired, but it was just such a fun week. With all these, it was like twenty of us from different colleges, and the missionaries. I just looked up to them because they were leading us <clears throat> on that trip. And I just remember thinking, I, I want to do this with students one day. Yeah, yeah. And and then yeah, I met uh, Andrea, and then also just the the grace from Our Lady and being in a place that she's appeared a place that 
she has just made her heart known to to so many Christians and how many miraculous healings have happened there. I know you've had a you've had a a podcast about yes, our Lady yeah, Lords, yeah. and I listened to that one. I was really excited. Um, now, <clears throat> I really hope to go back one day. Um, and so, kind of leading up, finishing up my studies, um, my undergraduate studies. I, I graduated from engineering in 2021, and then I started as a missionary. I accepted a, a job to uh, with Focus to become a missionary, and I was placed at the University of Kentucky. Um, and we can we can talk about my time as a missionary now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hear about that. So, what does it kind of entail? Is it the and a, a, a lots of questions. I mean, like the in in my mind, being separate from that, and many listeners are, would be you know with you in the thick of it right now. But it does seem like there's there's so much secular pressure. There's so much pressure to disengage from the world on one hand and certainly from religion. Like you already mentioned some statistics that are really alarming, like the number of people that, and of course we know this, like as people have gone to university campuses and had the experience, right? Where you, so many people you go there with and often sometimes yourself, you go and that's a place where you lose your faith. It's, it's kind of challenged maybe for the first time and you're maybe not really well prepared with the answers that you have for the kind of the, the secular kind of questions that come at you or you see people from other backgrounds you're like wait wait a minute but but they have this lifestyle that different than mine but why am i right and, and and they're wrong and like it's the it's almost a trope but it's a trope because it's so true it happens so frequently right that people go to college and they they lose their faith once yep. it's challenged so so i guess i don't know where to start but like maybe outline kind of what you do and i'm sure you're seeing those kind of things or maybe what what are you seeing would be a better mm -hmm. question to ask you yeah, I'm seeing a lot, um, a lot of things that might make people upset, but also a lot of things that make people hopeful. And uh, praise God for Newman centers. So, if for those of you who don't know, uh, Newman centers are set up at most secular universities, um, and they're they're run by the campus ministry there, or sometimes the diocese helps with it, but uh, they're normally the Catholic presence on campus. My, um, the college I went to didn't have a Newman Center. We just had a, a church right off campus that had a campus ministry as well. But the, uh, the university I work for now does have a Newman Center like many. Um, some very f famous and big ones are University of Nebraska Lincoln's Newman Center, um, Texas A&M's Newman Center, Kansas State's. These are some of the really big ones that hundreds and hundreds of students come into the church uh, at. And and hopefully the goal of every campus should have to be able to have those fruits as well. And we're trying to have that too at, at Kentucky. So I've been a focus missionary at Kentucky for the last three years, and I'm transitioning to be uh, the one of the Newman Center missionaries. So I'll be the Newman Center team director. We have both focus missionaries and Newman Center missionaries, uh, but we work as a collective unit to promote the gospel, to evangelize students and win them uh, to Christ. And so we're trained, which Focus does an amazing job of training its missionaries. We're trained primarily to do outreach on campus, to lead Bible studies, and to form men and women in discipleship groups. That's our bread and butter. And Focus does have a ton of resources on how to do that that's, that is steeped in church tradition and is steeped in the scriptures and the catechism. And we, we try to lead students primarily through the gospel message uh, as the first Bible study. So we'll, we'll, we'll go outreach on campus. We'll collect information. We'll meet people. We'll go um, spend time. Maybe if there's a, a volleyball court, we'll go play volleyball. If there's, um, you know, a, a, an event going on, we'll go to that. Maybe we'll we'll go get coffee with students. We just try to get in their lives because many of us had just graduated. Many of us know what it's like to be on a college campus. Being in college is 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 great. It's one of the uh, most amazing experiences any young person can have. But it's also very isolating. Think about how many students uh, on the college campus are, are depressed, or anxious, feel over um, over stressed, feel like they just don't know what to do. Maybe they're struggling with 
friendships. Maybe they're struggling with relationships. Maybe they're struggling in their classes and they're on their own for the first time. So the college, the college student, um, for, for many college campuses, um, is someone who is very isolated, lonely, and we, as missionaries want to encounter those students. And so whatever, whatever that looks like, whether it's um, meeting them after daily mass, meeting them on campus, going to different organizations. Like I've been leading a a rugby team Bible study for the last three years. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I've met probably 30 rugby guys and (laughs) <laughs> they commonly come to Bible study after practice. So you can just imagine the smell <laughs> in there. Um, but, but yeah, as, as a result of that, there's been eight or nine of them that have been walking in, in discipleship. Um, and, and some of them are even leading others in discipleship. And, and a couple of them have graduated and are moving on and are evangelizing in their own lives. And so that's really the goal of, of us missionaries <clears throat> is to equip students so that they can live out the gospel message and that they can go make disciples. Because the idea is Jesus Christ, who is the son of God, the Lord of all, he could have, if he wanted to, appeared to every person at once and said, I am God, and they would become a Christian. But that's not how he chose to do it. He chose 12 men to go invest in others and to start his church. And so if it's what he did, that's what we're going to do. So we work with college students to go invest in others. And we do that by teaching them the, the, the Christian worldview. Um, so we lead them, like I said earlier, through the, through the crux Bible study, which says, you know, we're made for a relationship with God. We're made out of love and for love. And sin has entered the world and it's broken that relationship and it's why the world is the way that it is and we as humans cannot do anything to make the world perfect we cannot fix anything in in this broken world on our own but but god can and that's why god became man and in the person of the second this in the second person of the blessed trinity and so having a relationship with him and coming to know him is the greatest gift. And when you can give your life to, to Christ, you you will have a much more fulfilled, a much for much more joyful life. It's not going to be without suffering, but it actually answers the question of suffering and having that conversion and walking with Christ. He transforms you. He doesn't, his, his righteousness is not imputed and it doesn't cover you. No, he transforms you from within. And, and finally, your response is to go and, and share that good news and to baptize others. You know, it's the Great Commission. And so our, our message as, as Catholic missionaries, and we're very far behind our, our Protestant brothers and sisters when it comes to this. Yeah, uh, the yeah, crew, right. you, crew you mentioned earlier, I believe they started in the 50s. Yeah, yeah. Um, and on, F- Focus's founder saw this. He was he was in college, um, I believe, in uh, probably the 80s or, or something like that. But he just noticed it, how there wasn't an option like this for Catholic students. <laughs> and Focus was founded in 1998, and it's been growing. And now I believe it's at over 200 campuses. But when you just compare that with the work that uh, the evangelical missionary organizations have been doing, it just pales in comparison. And I believe that it's because we're we're far behind <clears throat> simply because for so long we as Catholics have relied on the priests and the religious sisters to do all the work. Yes, yes, yes. And we don't realize that as, as lay men and women, we're called to this greatness as well. Um, and and I that's one thing that I definitely look look up to our Protestant brothers and sisters of they do such a good job of just being bold in their faith yeah. and just telling it like it is. And I really wish that we as Catholics could do uh, could step up and just do a better job. Um, things like evangelizing, even things like tithing, like they just it just it's just a given that you do these things, that you live out the Ten Commandments. And obviously, you know, no one's perfect, but um, helping these students to 
understand this and to see the world through a Christian lens, <laughs> that's that's really when true conversion happens because they start to see their relationship with Jesus as more than just something that you check the box for. It's actually something that you want to you want to be in and it's something that you want to give your whole life to. Like we want our students to to pray every day. We teach them how to pray every day. We walk with them in all these things. We're, we're not like um, just like teachers where we say, do these things, or this is why the church teaches you to do these things. And that's good. It has its place, but we go the next step as missionaries yeah, and yeah, we say, yeah. I want to get into your life and live it out with you. Yeah. I want to pray with you. I want to, um, to go evangelize out on campus with you. Um, I want to go to your rugby games. You know, I, and I've learned so much about rugby as, <laughs> as a result of that. But, yeah, a lot of my ministry as well is um, is with fraternity men. You know, as someone who is in a fraternity, I get to encounter fraternity men on a daily basis. I, I get to go and lead Bible studies in their fraternity houses. For many of these fraternity houses, it's the first time there's ever been a Bible study led in it. It's yeah. the first time that the Word of God has been opened. And these these men are truly starting to to maybe reaffirm their past convictions or they're starting to realize yeah the way i'm living my life isn't sustainable yeah, yeah. the way i'm living my life isn't isn't great and obviously there there is a divide between how we as missionaries are trying to live our lives and how the average maybe like semi practicing catholic is living his or her life and there, and that's hard. It, it is hard to kind of bridge that gap, but just placing our trust in in Jesus, um, I've seen firsthand over the last three years that it that it works and that it is fruitful. And there are men and women that are just eager and are thirsting for this truth, but no one's there to give it to them. Yeah. The the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fantastic stuff, Nathan. Amen, amen, amen. Preach it. I love it. I'm thinking of a few things here. And the first is like, you know, my wife and I are both converts to the Catholic faith. And we, we joke that the Catholic Church is like 30 years behind what the evangelical church was doing. I think it's pretty accurate in many, in many cases, right? And, you know, case in point, we're singing songs on a Sunday morning in our in our Catholic parish that we sang 30 years ago when we were evangelicals, right? In yeah. our churches yeah. growing up, right? And we know we know them by heart. So it's like, oh, this is heartwarming. I love this song, mm -hmm. right? But it's this, it's this, and that's new and modern, right? For our, for our parish kind of worship leader, right? Which yeah. is, which is cute and funny. Uh, and we love it. But in so many aspects, right? I think that's true. The church just moves slower. And it, it's a good thing, I think, in the sense that the church is not rushing into these new waves of things, mm -hmm. right? Every fad, mm -hmm. not chasing down every every kind of fad. We're not adding like spotlights and smoke machines to our to the mass, right? To try and be more like relevant. Be surprised. Yet, yet. Okay, <laughs> fair, fair enough. I won't hold my breath. But you know, the, you're talking about discipleship, right? Which is the key to this whole thing, and I think that. People like Sherry Waddell, you know, who 30 years ago wrote, wrote a fantastic book on, yeah. you know, not that long ago, but but not super recently, but, you know, that was huge for me becoming a Catholic. I realized that actually Catholics do talk this language of discipleship and like evangelization. It's just not super common. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what you're describing is is that that work, right? The work of, okay, you you tried this life of being a Catholic that went to Mass on Sundays, went to confession every six months or once a year or something, right? You tried that and that wasn't that wasn't a Catholic life that fed you, that, that formed you, right? And so many Catholics, you, you told us the stats, are kind of in that kind of boat. But what you're talking about is so radical, I think, and so and for all of us to understand, whether we're, you know, in college or not, but you're, thank goodness, forming this, you know, that generation of people mm -hmm. to then hopefully go and 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 go forward right is that discipleship piece the idea that you're not meant to just go to mass on sundays and say you know say the prayers of the mass go to confession every six months that's not how you be catholic like mm -hmm. you be catholic as a disciple of christ surrendering everything following him you know the whole way right 
going to mass as often as possible, praying as often as possible at all times, you know, Paul tells us, right? right? Doing these things, you know, living life, like you said, through that Catholic Christian lens, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the, you know, you, you, yes, I'm affirming everything you're saying. I think it's so brilliant and so, and so true. And it's such a different way of doing the Catholic faith. Right. It's it's not what I think most Catholics think of when they think of being Catholic. Like you're you know, you're raised to go to church on Sundays, do this, this. You are talking about an entirely different thing, right? That's really forming people in, in a different way, right? Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean it's just the way that the Lord did it and the early church did it, and yeah. we, we use the phrase yeah. or the Scripture verse Acts chapter two verse forty two, um, and the it talks about the early apostles in the early church. Um, the early church committed themselves to the prayers, to the breaking of the bread, to the fellowship, and to the teaching of the apostles. Yeah. So we try to model that. We say, you know, if if you're not committing yourself to praying, if you're not committing yourself to having a an, an intimate relationship with with God, if you're not, you know trying to conform your lives to the teaching of the apostles and the church, the, the authority of the church that Christ gave her. If you're not um, committing yourself to the sacraments, the breaking of the bread, to the Holy Eucharist, to confession, and if you're not committing yourselves to fellowship, to true, authentic, you know, community as a Catholic, then you, you will not make it through the world, the secular world. You will not last. And that's what's happening is it's, so it's not that people are saying, Oh, I just don't believe what the church teaches anymore. And that is the case for many people, but for more people, it's just that they don't care. Yeah. Like lack of care is the biggest reason people are falling away because they're told from an early age that the most important thing you can do is to go work for a big company or to go uh, make a lot of money or to try to get as much pleasure as you can out of this life. And whereas the, the the Christian ideal is, yeah, you can have happiness in this life, but it's not perfect happiness. It's actually waiting for you. And you're actually on a, on a path, you're on a journey to something that is out of our comprehension. Amazing. Uh, and so trying to instill in these, these students, these truths is, it can be difficult, but it's also very worth it. I mean, yeah. I, I just don't know what other worthwhile thing to do. And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, when are you going to get a real job? And I, <laughs> and I think, well, this, this is a real job because I'm, I'm impacting people's lives, yeah, yeah. obviously through, through the grace of God. But I, the fact that I get to do this is, is great. And, yeah, I'm probably not called to do it for, for 40 or 50 years just in this capacity. But knowing what I know now, I can be able to walk with people, with <laughs> with men and women. I'm just like learning the method of discipleship that was taught yeah. by our Lord and passed down to the apostles. And we're just living that out, um, but doing it through those four those four main pillars. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. I think you said to the idea that this used to be the work we thought it was the work of the of the clergy, right? like of the priests, uh, the religious sisters and brothers. That, that was that was their work to do, and the lay people weren't necessarily involved in that mission. And I think one of the big fruits of Vatican II, and a lot of Vatican II is very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had lots of guests on this show talking about the, the true nature of Vatican II, what it actually meant. And it's beautiful. It was, it's, it's a, <laughs> the documents are, are beautiful. Yeah. The intention of Vatican II was, was phenomenal, right? The idea of empowering the lady, saying, hey, this was your mission all along, guys. Go out and, go out and do this, right? Yep. Pray Liturgy of the Hours. Go be evangelist. Go evangelist. Share the gospel. Read the gospel. Like, all these things are, are brilliant pieces. The, the fruits you know, of, of Vatican II. And I think this is, this is one of them, right? That we, mm -hmm. we as lay people, right, are, are meant to get involved. We're meant to be the hands and feet of the Catholic Church. We're meant to be the people that other people see and go, hey, you're, you're Catholic. That, like, you live a very compelling life. To, you know, tell me more, right? And we should have an answer, right, for those people. Not just, you know, a guy doing a podcast or a, or a missionary like yourself, but everybody, 
every lay person should 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 have that kind of an answer. I can think of this for me is a is kind of my go to kind of telling moment. You know, when as an evangelical, deeply involved in in every church I was a part of, right? In my university years, I was involved in a very Pentecostal, very charismatic church, and mm. they plugged you into things, right? So we went to the young adults kind of ministry, and and before that was we fed all the students on campus. We opened up the, 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 the gym in the church and fed like 300 kids. And then after that had our Bible study and our worship time, right? So it was meant to have that service, that getting involved, that evangelization piece, plus then our like Bible study and a worship kind of thing, right? I mean, it would invite everyone that was there to join us afterwards at that part. And and some would, many would just eat the food and, and run. And that's, yeah. that's fine too, right? But that was, you know, you, you're getting involved, that discipleship piece that you learning and then giving was part of like the ethos in like yeah. those evangelical churches that I was yeah. always a part of. And I can remember becoming Catholic and on the night when it was like, okay, here's now how you can get involved in this parish now that you're Catholic, the lovely sister, I think she's probably deceased now, God rest her soul if she is, she was wonderful, yeah. you know, brought out like the the very old school photocopy dusty brochure that talked about how you can get involved in the parish and mm -hmm. it was things like knitting club right or the adult baby minding babysitting club for like it was you know it was or knights of columbus right these things that you know are, are kind of typical kind of catholic uh stereotypical catholic ways of getting in, of doing things but that's what the parish had for people to get involved and mm -hmm. i was i'm coming to that used to the idea that no, no, you're now you're a Christian. You evangelize. You get involved in these different groups, different outreaches, different ministries, different Bible studies. You plug in, mm -hmm. and here was this parish that was like, okay, here's what you can do. Do you like to sew? <laughs> do you like to hold babies during mass for young couples? And I was kind of like, wow, this is a different mentality. And that to me is like that, a prime example of that kind of mentality, right? The idea that, no, no, the priests do the missionary work. The, the sisters do the outreach work, right? Yeah. The, that's not for the lay people. We have clubs that talk about knitting or hold, you know, or, or hold babies, right? Not doing other things like that. And, you know, the, here's that 30 year gap that, that evangelical ethos, right? Is, is catching on the, in the Catholic faith, but that's, yeah. That, that should have always been the core, right? And Vatican II did that right in saying, hey, right? Like in the 60s, so like, you know, you know 50 years ago now, hey guys, you should be doing this too, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think what you're doing is living that out on campus, right? That can be done, should be done everywhere, right? right. That, that the thing that we we all need to be doing, right? Exactly, yeah. The And that's, one of the great skills that you learn as a missionary, but also as a student leader, when you're doing these yeah, things and yeah. you're say you want to start leading Bible study as a student leader <clears throat> at the beginning of, at the beginning of the school year. And you don't know anybody that wants to be in your Bible study. So, you know, for those first couple of weeks of mass, you got to go meet people after mass. You got to go meet people at the, you know, spaghetti dinner you're talking about. Yeah, and yeah. especially those freshmen that are coming in that don't have community yet, you got to meet them and then and, and get to know them. And then you can extend that invite and you can forge those relationships and that, yeah, you bring that up such a good point. And another thing that especially uh, your mega churches are doing, they do such a great job of is that you are welcomed, you are brought in, you're taken care of when you go to church. And there's just so many times in, in Catholic churches that that's not happened. And so us as missionaries, you know, especially when, <clears throat> especially when we go to daily mass throughout the week on campus, and if we see a new student who comes to daily mass, you know, we might not have, we might not, and we know that that student's going to, going to bolt immediately after the final blessing. You know, we might not stay to, to, to pray and to give God our thanks. Uh, Cause we might have to go meet that person and, you know, we can, we can pray later, but it just shows that we, we have to be cognizant of who's around us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even when there's new, new adults, new, um, new older people that come in, you just want to talk to them and get to know it's so simple, but it's the fact that it's not happening. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. as Catholics, we need to do better at just making sure that the people that are new are 
are feeling welcomed because there are so many students. And we hear this all the time because there's only seven of us missionaries and we can't reach the 300 students that come to mass for the first week of the school year. But there are so many students that say, I went to mass my first week of my freshman year. I didn't meet anybody. No one came up to me. So I never went back. Yeah. yeah and, yeah. you know, we see the steep drop off of mass attendance right after, right after the first couple of weeks of school. Cause number one, most of these people are going by themselves because they don't have their parents to go with anymore. And then number two, they don't have to go. Like, I mean, they do have to go according to the law of the church, but they don't know that. And and they don't, they choose to, to not because there's not that pressure on them anymore. And obviously that's kind of the mindset I had where I still wanted to go to mass in college when I started, because I knew I should have done it, but I, but now, now knowing what the mass actually is, like, how could I not go is kind of the mentality (laughs) I have. But you also bring up kind of an interesting point about the second Vatican council and something that I do notice as well. That's a huge trend among young people um, is kind of that return tr- to the traditional elements yeah, of, of the yeah. church. And, and I'm not saying that everyone has to go to the traditional Latin mass. I'm just saying that the students and young people in general love the reverence. They love the, the smells, the incense, the bells, the vestments, the just all of these things, because that was honestly kind of a, another deep conversion within me after I, graduated college because I'd never been to like a really, really reverent mass before. And, and then I just started to really get into that. And it's no wonder that so many students are, are finding uh, a lot of spiritual fruit in those more traditional elements, certain devotions that maybe had been uh, discontinued uh, over the past couple or a few decades. Um, You know, and while some of the, those things may have been discarded as pious, superstitious things, maybe like praying the rosary every day or uh, doing um, certain certain pious acts, they actually do affect us. I mean, the, yeah. the law of prayer is the law of belief. And as much as, you know, people talk about maybe things before the council as bad, they worked. I mean, people like kneeling to receive the Eucharist and receiving on the tongue, like people knew that that piece of bread is not just a piece of bread. And there's this sort of cognitive dissonance that happens to the the average college student when they, they go up and they just receive, you know, without a second thought. And, you know, obviously that's not going to change the way that they live the rest of their, their week. And so when I started to, implement some of these, some of these things. Uh, it not only increased my, my love for the Eucharist and for the mass, but it helped others to do, to do so as well. And, um, now we have a ton of students who come to our Thursday night student mass and it's, it's much more reverent. It's much more sacred. Um, obviously you can't, you can't make the mass more sacred, but you can make you, you can at least add um, some of the elements that, that God is due to that. I, I like the idea of the, uh, the diamond. You can't, you can't change the, the price of a diamond, but if you put it in a proper setting, it will be, uh, it, 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 the light will shine off of it a lot, a lot more yeah. uh, in, in a much more beautiful way. And so these students, uh, I'm noticing while they're becoming more evangelical, they're also becoming more traditional yeah, and right. that's what's bearing the most fruit amongst all the college campuses I've been to. Um, and so they're, they're being able to, I would even say being charismatic and traditional, they're being able to hold these two things in tension. Whereas I feel like previous generations just chose one or the other. And obviously in, in previous generations, the past, you know, maybe 50 or 60 years had, tended more towards, well, let's uh, make, make the mass more accessible and yes, let's I thought, get, get rid of, the worst get rid of some of these, um, yes, some yeah, of these yeah. be- more beautiful elements. And it, and really just learning about all these things and even just like, I have like a more 
a more traditional missile that I'll open up and read some of these prayers. I'm just like, this is beautiful. I can't believe this is, is something that's not more widely um, just like practiced in the church now. Like there's yeah. a lot of, a lot of hymnals that most of the songs are about me, me, me. Yes. You know, yes. Most of the songs are about uh, more of like your, your social justice, which is great, but that's not the peak of worship. The peak of worship should be directed towards God. So, and, and, uh, and the students really catch on to that too. And <clears throat> even students that are more, maybe charismatic in nature, they desire these, like they desire authentic Catholicism. Yeah. Um, and, and it, what, it, another thing it does is it brings in Protestants. Yeah. We, we have so many uh, Protestants who are considering joining the, the church. And a lot of times they, they notice, they say, Hey, there's gotta be more to, to worshiping the one true God than going to a, a, a mega church and listening to a, a nice sermon for 40 minutes and singing some songs. There's got to be more than, to it than that. And that's where you come in and say, like, look, this is the mass. It's what's been going on for 2,000 years. It's the representation of the sacrifice of Calvary. It's truly Jesus. And there's a little bit more or there's a little bit less anti-Catholicism than, than maybe there used to be uh, back in the day because I think the we're, we're at a point now where there's just less animosity between Protestants and Catholics. I think most of that is because we see what the secular world is providing yeah, and that's yeah. much more scary than what we could quibble about, which what we do quibble about is important, but I just see a lot more friendship uh, between, between Protestants and Catholics. And I think that's ironically, I think that's what true ecumenism is. It's not saying let's put aside all of our differences forever and not talk about the things that divide us. But I think it's actually saying, no, let's like explore what we each have to offer yeah, yeah. so that we can go convert the rest of the world because <laughs> the rest of the world is what truly needs it. Yeah. Um, and so there's just been a lot of like, I, I, we get to work with other campus ministries. I, I even took a, I audited a class this past semester at one of the uh, campus ministries at Kentucky, one of the Protestant campus ministries at Kentucky. And it was, it was great. Um, it was called defending the Christian faith. And it's this idea of defending the, the, the mere Christianity side of things. So like the problem of evil and how to defend the resurrection and how to, you know, Get proofs for God's existence and learning about those things and people from all kinds of denominations coming in and um, being together in that class. And I think that as the years go on, from what I'm seeing, um, these the tensions will continue to to kind of go away little by little. Um, and I think we can make a lot of progress towards reunification as as a as a church, at least in. Um, the United States and maybe the West because of the outside pressure we're facing yeah, from the yeah. secular world. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> that's fantastic. There's so much, I mean, there's so much in there to mine. I mean, I'm a liturgist at heart. I love the liturgy uh, deeply. And I think what you, you know, your, your description of, of what is drawing in student, the students that you see right on the front lines of campuses is very heartening for me to hear. And I think just affirm some of my, my thinking, maybe my prejudices and my, my own personal hangups and <laughs> issues with so many parishes across Canada and the U S mm -hmm. right. Is this idea that, that, you know, accessibility, you mentioned that word, like welcoming is another word that, that I would use, right? We've in some cases just dumbed things down in the liturgy. So to the, the, the base level in the thought that that's going to welcome people in and draw them into the Catholic faith. And I think, I mean, I've, I've led RCA for a number of years in a couple of parishes, you know, I've been involved in campus ministry, very tangentially, you're in the thick of it, and are just kind of aff affirming my, my beliefs here, Nathan, that it's not those welcoming, dumbed down liturgies that are drawing people into the Catholic faith, right? It's that 
the things that hint towards or lean on the sacred, right? That's drawing people in, right? Yeah. It's the it's the Gregorian chant in the mass. It's the yeah. incense. It's the receiving on the tongue because you recognize that that is you know that the hand is fine, but you know that, that the, the the tongue is a symbol. Say, yeah, no, you know what? I know what's going on here for sure, and I'm I'm doubling down on that, right? That's that's again leaning on the sacred there, like these things. I think, gosh, that's what's drawing people in, right? And it's not just, it's not just students, of course, right? That's the front line you're working on. That's got to be people from all, all ages and stages of life, right? Yeah. Are being drawn to that, right? <laughs> I, I can't think of more than a couple of people, who, and it's more in spite of the mass they encountered, they became Catholic anyway. It wasn't because they encountered this, this awful terrible mass but they encountered an awful terrible mass and they still became catholic in spite of that but nobody that i've ever talked to has been drawn into the catholic faith by these kind of dumbed down liturgies right but it's this backwards idea that we have to make things more simple and accessible and understandable to draw people into the catholic faith but no we have to amp up the sacredness yeah. <laughs> right that's what's that's what's drawing people in yeah, I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. I, yeah. I think yeah. you can you can even tell the more reverent a mass is, the more packed it will be, and the younger it will be. Yeah, That's, yeah. I mean, I've been as a missionary, I get to travel a lot and be around a lot of different places and in in the U.S. and the country and visit visit other missionary friends who are at different campuses. And without fail, the more that the priest T like takes the mass seriously, yeah, seriously. the more that he yeah. celebrates reverently, it, it typically even increases his, his ability to give a homily. Like I always, I always love homilies and more traditional churches because it's what I need to hear yeah, 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 and yeah. all these things. And it's just, it's bringing people, these young families, these big families, yeah, you know, families that are open to life, families that are living out the moral teachings of the church faithful Catholics it's bringing it you know we have a we have a joke that um I went to this <clears throat> I went to this uh traditional Latin mass parish a few times over the summer last last summer when I was we were training in Lincoln Nebraska and the whole parking lot was just like 12 past 12 seat yes, past yes, I love it. <laughs> yes that's how we yeah and uh and and obviously like I said no no parish is is perfect but they a lot of times they have really strong communities yeah. and those communities, you know, back in the 1800s when the, when the church in America was, was doing pretty well and building all these beautiful churches, it was the the community. And, and they all, a lot of, they all, a lot of them were from the same country. They would immigrate and they would build up this community centralized around the church. Yeah. And it caused, um, just such a growth and there were so many baptisms and there's so many new people coming into the church as a result of that. And the churches and the campuses and all of that, that are centered around this community are going to have, uh, it's around this community and this, this, this traditional form of worship and, and sticking to the traditional teachings of the church have the fruit and yeah. it's undeniable. It's yeah. at a point where you cannot sit by and say that that's not, a, a true f fruit producing area of the church. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, because yeah, because you mentioned that the it's those sacred masses that also are those charismatic, those evangelical, mm -hmm. kind of inspiring masses, right? And I totally, you know, I I get that as a you know charismatic Christian in my background. That's what I, I I wouldn't be excited to go to a mass that's kind of bland and the songs are songs that I sang 30 years ago, right? It, it, in that context, what's going to draw in people who are who are who are first of all kind of charismatic leaning or really want to embrace what the Holy Spirit is doing are those masses that feel sacred and where the like you said the priests just take it things seriously mm -hmm. right the liturgy is done well because it, people who are doing liturgy understand the importance of what's going what's going on there right and that in turn like that you know the community the the sacredness that kind of 
like you said, that engenders, that, that creates the, that evangelical drive, that drive to then go and evangelize, like live out your Catholic life because, you know, you've been fed in that sacred space, right? You've, you've, you understand what's going on there and want to go out and, and share that, right? And that feeds back into the community and this, it's this whole beautiful kind of synergy happening mm -hmm. there, right? But I think that's, that's wonderful to hear and I think so important for you know anybody involved in parish ministry, anybody involved in a parish that wants to see it grow more or be more intentional or be a place for families to come or be a place that welcomes new Catholics who are looking into to the faith or you know or, or, or converts, right? Mm -hmm. And exciting to hear that that's kind of the, the front line, the frontier of the college campus, and that's what you're seeing, and that's very exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, I love it. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Another another thing too that, that I notice, and you know, I have a, a ton of thoughts, but I can just keep it to a couple more. Is that um, we're we're in a period where the church is beginning, but we need to continue this to uh, remasculinize the church. So we need strong strong husbands and fathers. Obviously, we need strong spiritual fathers. We need uh, we need more priests. There's a huge lack of vocations. We just need more. Um, the more men that are willing to step up. And I think that as, especially over the past, you know, couple of decades, maybe going back to the sexual revolution with this idea that um, the women can, can have this power and which is, which is great. We want equality, but um, this idea that, Oh, the women are going to take care of the needs of the church. Sure. And yeah. think about all the church ladies that keep the candles on and, yeah. and, and go up to father and, you know, make sure that he's doing okay. And, and the men have just deserted and like, wh where are we at? And if you, if you go to any suburban church on a, on a daily mass or even a Sunday mass, you'll probably see 70% women. And so we need to, especially just as men, like understanding our, how being a Christian man is the, is the best way to be a man because, obviously Christ gave the, the ultimate sacrifice. And as men, that's what we're ordered towards is to yeah, give our lives. Yes, yeah. And so, you know, I, I get to work with these men all the time and I tell them like, listen, if, if you, if you don't get the teachings of the church part, if you don't, you know, if maybe that's too theological, maybe if it's just a little too above your pay grade, just like be a good virtuous man because you you will find a an amazing virtuous holy woman and you will have children and you will continue to rebuild the church in this way you know if you're going to be an, an engineer or um a plumber or an electrician or a lawyer or any of these things right you're going to you're going to evangelize a lot more by just being a faithful man who um, goes to mass, who prays the rosary, you're going to impact your children. You're going to impact your children's children. Cause I know I like to bring up statistics, but uh, I think, and I, and I don't want to get all these statistics messed up, but the, the idea is if the father is the one who's the spiritual head of the family, the children are much more likely yeah, to remain yeah, Christian. Yeah, yeah. If the mother is the head of the spiritual head of the family children are much less likely because they look at their dad and they say well if he doesn't take if, yeah, if he doesn't care yes. about this then why should i care about this and so there's just a huge lack of masculinity and i'm and i'm talking about um like true authentic christian masculinity not like not your masculinity that says oh we need to swear off women <laughs> not your masculinity that says i need to go sleep around with as many women as yeah, possible yeah. and i need to go buy as much uh as much stuff and have as many cars as i can I'm talking about masculinity like Saint Joseph, yeah, um, and, yeah, and masculinity like people like Saint Augustine, and people like um, Pier Giorgio Frassati, and, and and people that and like John Paul II. Thinking think about these men who love to live adventurous yeah. lives, but who are first and foremost devoted to to following Christ, and it has a reflection in their vocations, whether they're priests or or fathers. Um, and husbands and just helping, yeah, helping these, these men is, is something that one of the best things I can do. And honestly, 
from a day-to-day perspective, I spend a lot more time giving sort of like spiritual direction than I do teaching about (laughs) the faith. It's these guys that come up to me and they're like, you know, I've been going through some rough times with my girlfriend or, you know, I need your advice on this or man, I just, I just really need someone to talk to. And, and that's really the, the gold of being a missionary is just being someone to listen. Um, and, and women are just more naturally ordered towards doing that. I mean, women's Bible studies take like four hours because (laughs) they just can't stop talking. Um, men's Bible studies, it takes us a little bit more time to like loosen up around each other. Um, but I I just get to walk with these men and I think we have discipleship chains. And I started with, uh, this year actually has been our biggest year of growth. I started with, um, around eight or nine men in discipleship that I was walking with or that someone I was walking with was walking with other people. And at the end of the year we had, uh, 29. So we went from eight to 29 in, in Kentucky. We had, we started the year with overall all the missionaries and just their chain and just campus ministry in general. We had 70 students who were doing discipleship, who were devoting their lives to Jesus. Uh, Cause when we, when we ask you into discipleship, we say, are you willing to make Christ the center of your life to the best of your ability? And they say, yes. That's and, amazing. and that number went from 70 to 131 just this year. And so there's been a ton of, of fruit that's come from uh, the ministry. And it's just because we're, we're trying to follow these, these teachings of the church and stay close to the Lord in prayer and the sacraments. And yeah, to tie it all back together, we're just, we're trying to teach these men how to be virtuous or teach these students how to be virtuous Christian men and women. Um, and we're trying to remind them of the truths of the Catholic faith. Uh, and 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 in in turn, we're telling them invite all your friends, bring them all in. If they have questions, that's the best thing we can do is answer questions. The worst thing we can do is to see you not have any care and to not ask questions at all, and to not come back to mass the the next Sunday. Um, and so it, it breaks our heart. We have, um, you know, it, it is one of the hard, especially like days like Ash Wednesday. So Ash Wednesday is the number one day of students coming to mass every year on the college campus wow, interesting. because, well, it's not like Easter or Christmas cause you're already at home with your family, but Ash Wednesday you're on campus, right? And everyone wants to get their ashes. So you'll see, I think we had over th- like 1500 students come to mass um, for Ash Wednesday. And so we had, we needed all hands on deck um, and our, and our priest, gave an incredible homily and he said you know what good is giving up chocolate for for lent if you're not going to come to mass on sundays <laughs> and that next that next yeah. sunday we broke the record for most students at a student <laughs> um and so like i'm saying just these i'm, I'm giving these statistics that make you kind of sad but i'm also providing you with some anecdotes that that give you hope yes yeah, and the, the the ministry here at the university of kentucky is popping off. And so our ministry is at a ton of campuses around the country. A ton of people are coming to to faith in Christ or joining the church. Um, You know, the the church might be getting smaller numbers wise, but I think it's getting stronger. And I think both things are true at once. And I think that's what Pope Benedict was talking about. He's saying we're going to go into a time where the church might be really small and might have to go underground, but it will be really strong. It will turn, it will turn back into more of that apostolic mindset of we might have to give it all for our faith, but we're going to be true and faithful Christians. And it's really going to shape the world. And we're really going to be that next generation of Christians who inspire those who are not Christian, just like, just like it's happened the past 2000 years. Um, and so that's really the missionary spirit is to see, see souls, uh, come to, come to, come to life through knowing our Lord. And, uh, uh you know, what more could I ask for? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Nathan, that's powerful stuff. 
That's that's incredible. I wasn't wrong to to sense that passion in your first email to me, Nathan, when you <laughs> wanted to, like I gotta I gotta share this. I'm like, yes, you did. That that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank thank you for that. I mean, all that. That that's awesome. I mean, the, the good news, the scary news. You know that that hope here, like, and I absolutely affirm everything that you're saying. Right, that smaller, stronger church, and you see this in the front lines, and mm -hmm. that, that that that's a hopeful message, right? Of course, Christ is never going to abandon His church, but it's exciting to hear that this work is is ongoing. That that's right. amazing. Anywhere you want to point people towards to, I don't know, learn more about the work that you're doing or the work that the Newman Centers are doing or Focus is doing, like anything, I I, I can put it all in the show notes. Anywhere you think that people might want to go to to explore further? What do you think? Um, not in particular. I, I do have a support page. If anybody would like to support me as a missionary, um, they're more than welcome to do that. You know, we we rely on the support of, of mission partners. Um, I mean, I have an Instagram, but not super uh, super involved on it. But I've I've dipped my toes a little bit into the uh, making theological posts, but that just seems like a lot <laughs> right now. I think people, <laughs> people like grassroots Catholic and all that are doing great. So I'm just going to stay away from that and be on the, uh, just be on the front lines in the, in the real world, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, just ask for all your listeners to, to pray for me and pray for the campus, uh, at, at university of Kentucky and for all, all campuses across the nation, really just pray for, campuses in general and pray for college students because they're being fed so much lies, so many lies. And I mean, it's especially in the month of June, you know, I'm glad that college is not in session right now, but um, it's pride month, you know, and yeah. it's, it's a difficult time uh, to, to be a missionary, but, but yeah, it's just these things that you, that you're kind of surrounded with. And like I said, you, uh, you fall prey to it if you're not if you're not careful and you're not uh, willing to defend your faith. Um, so just pray for pray for the strength of college students, especially that they discern the priesthood, the religious life, and uh, the marriage marital vocation. Amazing, absolutely, Nathan. A real uh, pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Thanks for reaching out. This has been an awesome conversation. I do want to say God bless you and the work that you're doing. We will pray for you. Please pray for us too. That's cool. awesome, Nathan. And thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks, Keith. I really appreciate it. And just keep keep doing what you're doing as well. May the <laughs> Lord be with you. Thank you so much.